I'm Ben Kelly. I'm here today with Rory Stewart, independent columnist, and we're going to be discussing your latest column, Rory, which is all about the big topic at the moment, which is Brexit. It's finally here. Obviously, you're concerned with Brexit and its impact on London. As things currently stand, uh, what's going to happen to London once we've left the EU? Well, I think the first really important thing is that the devil is always in the details. Everybody understands the broad swathe, but with Brexit for the last two and a half years, we've always had the same problem, which is basically Brexit has been a cultural thing. People have either been for it or against it. It's always been about the what, but the how of Brexit, in other words, exactly what the details are of the kind of trade agreement you set, has been very, very unpopular with anybody. And now that's what's got to happen. Right, we've got to get out of a world where people are either burying their head in the sand and saying, I'm going to block Brexit. There are still people saying it with only a few days to go. And other people just trying to celebrate and bong Big Ben down to what we need to do for financial services, what we need to do in immigration, and a thousand other detailed issues that we need to sort out. And in your column, you sort of break down how you want to tackle Brexit and, and going forward if you're a mayor of London. Um, what are the overview of those, those ideas that you have? We need to break it down into different chunks. So for me, everything starts with safety and security. And I'll come on to that in a second. But our relationship with the European Union is absolutely vital for keeping people safe in London. The second thing is to think about immigration and visas. The people that we have in London already who come from the European Union, how to look after them. And then how to make sure we have the most talented people from Europe still able to come to London. And the third thing is specific regulations around businesses in London, how we make that all operate for us. And then I think the final thing, which packages the whole thing together, is how do we conduct ourselves negotiating with the central government to make sure that we get the deal we want? How do we get the right balance between being tough and charming when we need to be to make sure that London gets what it needs? And I suppose, just jumping in on the last point, uh, the Brexit negotiations and the, the future trading agreements with the rest of the world, that's going to be a sort of top-level government thing. What could you, as Mayor of London, really be doing to, to, to change that? Well, I think two things. One is that government always needs the details. Government is very, very dependent on businesses actually coming forward and talking about their specific sector. So, for example, in London, the insurance sector is huge, and one of the biggest issues is going to be about uh, the liquidity requirements, the solvency requirements. At the moment, it's actually quite difficult for the British insurance sector to invest in infrastructure. That's something we want them to do. I want to get British insurance investors investing in affordable housing in London, transport schemes. So that specific issue is about making sure the experts from that sector get to government. And that's really where the Mayor of London, one of the roles of the Mayor of London, is to lead those delegations in and to use the relationships that I've developed over years with these different ministers in the government to make sure that we really dot every I and cross every T. And can London be more appealing than, let's say, cities within the EU, let's say Frankfurt or Paris or Dublin, where we see other companies starting off big bases and other people relocating? Uh, can London really compete with that after Brexit? London can definitely compete. I mean, we have huge advantages here. And, and the biggest advantage is just people want to live in this city. It's partly about the English language, partly about time zone, but it's also about just an amazing culture, amazing place where people want to send their children to school, they like the houses, they like the green space. So it's actually ours to lose in some ways. People would prefer to remain in London. And provided we create the environment, the habitat, where people think actually their businesses can flourish and there's a, a future, people will continue to want to be in London. It's a great place to run a business. But that's why we need to be very, very careful over the next few weeks and months to make sure that nothing we do on regulation or taxation or tariffs and quotas drive people unnecessarily away. Uh, going back to your first point, you mentioned uh, security. Obviously, London security is, is the UK security and it's very intricately linked with our partners across the, the channel. Um, what do we stand to lose by breaking away from, from EU institutions? So at the moment, we're part of this big 300 million strong databases which give you information on tens of millions of people across Europe. Right? And that includes criminal record databases, Schengen information system databases. And that is a lot of what allows you to stay up to date on tracking dangerous people, whether they are British people going to the continent or people from the continent coming to Britain, or indeed people from outside traveling through any of these countries. 
So for our proper border checks to work, for our police to be able to follow up, for us to be able to identify people on the street, and even to get the data links, if you stop and arrest someone, to know that they're actually wanted in another country, we need these systems working, we need to have access to that. And this is the first big fundamental ask that I'd make to the government. This is non-negotiable, right? There's sometimes been a bit of talk about, well, maybe we could use participation in these systems as a bargaining chip to get some other deal on the side for some other sector. I don't know, something on milk quotas in exchange for, for police record databases. No, right? We have to remain safe. We do this on its own. We talk about safety on its own. If we do that, I think we can get a good deal with Europe because it's in both our interests to do it. But we don't try to hold people in Europe hostage or ourselves hostage around something as sensitive as this. It's not something that should be dividing us or... Right, it's something we need to get right. And, and London is not safe enough. London could be much safer. But it's definitely going to damage London if we don't get those databases right. Because everything really in policing, and it's always been true even before modern computing, has been about having the intelligence, the information to know who someone is and to make sure you get your police officers, security people in the right place at the right time. And does this link down to, let's say, lower level issues that people are very concerned, let's say things like knife crime on the streets, which people might not necessarily think as being linked with you know, crime and terror further afield, but is that all linked in your mind in terms of keeping the, the city safe? Yes, because many of the things that we see are symptoms of much bigger networks. So, for example, knife crime is often connected to, to drugs and drug gangs, and those are by their nature international. Generally speaking, many of the people involved in them and many of the drugs themselves are coming from other countries. So to be able to stay on top of serious organized crime in particular, you desperately need these databases. And it's very, very striking how a lot of the street crime in London actually does connect back. These aren't necessarily different worlds. They're often different levels of the same world. The other point that you touched on was in terms of immigration and obviously London's openness. You know, we've, we've long been a huge city for people coming in and particularly from Europe. Um, and know we're about to undergo somewhat of a change. Now, you're going up against the current mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. He said, you know, London is open. He's very much saying the same kind of things in terms of, you know, let's keep our door open no matter what's happening in the rest of the country. What's different in terms of your promises for what you're going to do? Well, I think the big difference is that it, it's about detail. It's about how you do things rather than just the slogans. So, at the moment, there are nearly 900,000 European Union citizens in Britain who have not registered to get their proper residency status sorted out. And that's about details. That's about actually contacting those people, making the system work for them, working with them. They're completely entitled to have that status, but they haven't made it through the system. So the first thing I would do as mayor is go out and make sure that that nearly a million people actually were supported to get that status sorted out. And the second thing is making sure that you make the arguments on the basis of evidence for the fact that we desperately need European Union citizens to work in our care sector, but also at a totally different level, we need computer scientists from Europe to work to keep our tech sector going in London. So openness is one thing, but making those arguments and getting the details sweated right is what's going to make a difference. And in terms of the big cultural divides that, that you know, you, you mentioned Brexit has really opened up in the country. Um, you talk in your column this week about wanting to, you know, bring the UK back together again and kind of get us all on the same page. London's obviously always been about openness and much more open to immigration, let's say, than other parts of the country. Uh, how do we sort of bridge that gap going forward so we can maybe talk about the benefits of you know, being open to the world throughout the whole country? Well, I think the first thing is people need to feel that London works for Britain. I mean, London is not a city-state. This isn't sort of Singapore on Thames. This is the national capital. We have our parliament here, our government here, the National Theatre here, the National Gallery, the British Museum, it's all in London. So we have to make the whole of the United Kingdom feel that this is a city that they can relate to and that works for them. And that's partly about facts and data explaining how much of the economy of other parts of the United Kingdom benefits from the wealth of London, explaining that 38 billion pounds a year of taxation revenue from London, for example, goes to other parts of the United Kingdom. But it also behoves us in London to conduct ourselves in a way that shows that we understand that we're part of a bigger country. And most of us in London, after all, were not born in London. We all come from other places. We all understand that there's a world outside London. Even if we like to pretend when we come to London that we never knew that there was some world before London. So we need to remember that. 
and we need to remember that actually this is a great, great city, but it'll be greater still if it stretches out to encompass the whole country. Supposing you are lucky enough to become mayor in May, uh, you got four years, looking down the, the road to 2024, what will London look like uh, in terms of its relationship with Europe and the rest of the world in, in 2024? Well, one of the big things I'd want to do is to make sure that we remain culturally very close. So I'd like to announce that we will have our own Erasmus scheme, which was the exchange scheme at universities, which I'm very disappointed the government voted against. London should have its own. We should keep those links open. And I would have a mayoral scholarship and work with businesses to encourage UK citizens to be able to go to European universities and vice versa. Um, I would make sure that we had our own mission in Brussels, negotiating for London, because on a lot of these very technical issues around financial services, my experience in the Foreign Office is you need the technical expertise from the businesses to be able to talk that through. Third thing is you need to understand Europe's going to be changing. Europe will change very rapidly. We need to track and keep up the ways they change. At the moment, we're on the corners, but as Europe diverges and changes, we need to help influence and shape that process. But above all, I want London to feel like, if not a European Union city, still the capital of Europe. And finally, uh, as we leave the EU, a lot of people in London, whether they're from here or whether they're Europeans in London, you know, they'll feel like a door is closing to them. What is your message to them as, as Brexit happens? The message is that we are so proud of the contribution of European citizens to London that London would not begin to be what it is today were it not for French, Italians, Poles, Spanish, Portuguese, Germans, and so on and so forth. And you see it everywhere. You see it in some of our very, very most smartest people. The director of the British Museum, for example, is a European Union citizen. We sense it in our incredible food. We sense it in our most successful companies. We sense it just in the atmosphere of our theater, of our performance, of our design. This is a great European city. I, I would argue probably the greatest capital in Europe. And we can only continue to flourish as Britain if these countries, which are our nearest neighbors, which are links to our civilization, from whom we learn, we continue to learn. And I want to make sure that London remains deeply, deeply European. Rory, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.